Hello, everybody. Welcome to our online Bible study uh, on the life of the Apostle Paul. It's, we're just so glad that you can join us this evening. Tonight, our text is going to be found in Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Uh, we just appreciate so much, all of you, for your kind words and your participation in this online Bible study on the life of the Apostle Paul. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, it's a help to you as we study God's Word together. One of my favorite artists was the American illustrator and painter Norman Rockwell. Uh, Rockwell was panned by serious art critics, but Rockwell was a master at catching the American experience in his paintings. And I've always been drawn to the facial expressions of Norman Rockwell's paintings, the emotion and the feeling conveyed in those faces uh, pretty much tell a complete story in and of themselves. In one particular painting, we see this particular scene. Um, a mother says, my son is home. And in her apron and her woolen sweater, the mother leans over the porch railing and her arms are outstretched and she's welcoming her son home from the war. And she's the central figure in Norman Rockwell's painting, Homecoming G.I. And the young soldier that she longs to hug stands in the foreground of the painting in his outgrown uniform and he's facing the ramshackle tenement and uh, his little brother darts down the stairs to see him and his sisters are squealing with excitement and the neighbors too, they're peering out the doors and the windows and over fences and around corners and off to the side, the, the soldier sweetheart stands up against the wall and she's smiling shyly and, you know, because he's home. You know, this particular Saturday Evening Post cover captured the homecoming dreams of families all over America at the close of World War II. Well, centuries before, battle-weary Paul and Barnabas had also dreamed of their homecoming day. Soon the Holy Spirit, having punched their return tickets, they would be standing before family and friends, feeling the warmth of home. These two missionaries had been away for months. They had journeyed from Antioch in Syria to Cyprus. They had preached Christ throughout the island of Cyprus. They had confronted Ilimus, the sorcerer, and uh, the governor of the island was converted under their preaching. And then they sailed to Perga, where Paul evidently became ill, probably with malaria. And John Mark abandoned uh, the, the missionary group. And then up the Tarshish Mountains they went. And they wound up in Pisidian Antioch, which was different than Syrian Antioch, where they had started. And, uh, but in Pisidian Antioch, they had reached the crossroads of Inland Asia Minor. Iconium was their next step. Then Pagan Lystra, where they were worshipped as gods before Paul was stoned and left for dead. Miraculously surviving the stoning, Paul went on with Barnabas to Derby. And we read in Acts chapter 14, verse 21, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Now, we're going to follow along as they backtrack through the cities that they've just evangelized, visiting newly established churches along the way. Some scholars have speculated that by this time, new Roman magistrates were in office. And even if that were true, the Jewish communities in all those cities remained in unmoving opposition to the gospel that Paul and Barnabas preached. Uh, Paul and Barnabas knew that it was far more dangerous to the gospel cause for those new flocks, though, not to be strengthened. 
Uh, they needed to speak to them. They needed to feed the sheep that they had left behind. Now, there's no mention here <coughs> of any attempts to uh, reconcile the wrongs that they had suffered. There were no angry outbursts. There were no request, uh, regrets. Their focus remained the same, pursuing an authentic ministry for the glory of God. See, in everything that Paul did, the glory always, always was given to God. Now, this part of their missionary journey is easy to sort of overlook, but it was a crucial aspect of the spread of Christianity. And while the first part of their journey had been for evangelism, this part of their journey was to feed the young new converts. These new believers in those days, they had no seminars on the Christian life to attend. There were no church growth manuals for them to follow. There were no books. There were no discipleship classes. There was nothing like that. They didn't even have a New Testament to read. So Paul and Barnabas, they gathered their courage and they retraced their steps through the, the blood and the sweat and the tears that they had suffered before, and they went back through Lystria and Iconium and Pisidian Antioch to give those churches vital instructions. And as they traveled and as they taught the people, they have a five-step plan for building up the believers. And it's a plan that we can follow today in our homes and in our churches today. The first thing we see is, is that they strengthened their souls. That was their first objection. Uh, uh, their, their first objective is to strengthen these new believers. We are told in verse 21 of Acts chapter 14, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. Now that word strengthening is rarely used in the New Testament, but it's been defined to make more firm, to give us additional strength to. Uh, we might say to beef up or to add strength to what is already present. These new believers have only had appetizers of truth for their nourishment, and they now need a full course meal to put meat on their spiritual bones. Now, th this should be the goal of every pastor, to strengthen those whom God has entrusted him with. And the only way to strengthen disciples is to teach the word of God. When Jesus told Peter to feed my sheep, he was instructing Peter to teach the word of God. Now, this is important for all of us to think about. How far are we willing to go when it comes to growing in Christ? You see, the goosebumps and the good feeling that we received when we gave our lives to Jesus, they sure felt good, but they didn't, it didn't last long. Faith is not sustained by being a goosebump junkie. You have to be intentional about growing. It doesn't just happen. Um, I remember hearing Leonard Ravenhill say one time, you are only as spiritual as you choose to be. Um, I remember hearing a story once about a, a, a fellow who lived up in the mountains and somehow he had, had uh, contracted a severe rash and he came down into town to be examined by one of the town doctors. And after the usual history taking, followed by a, a series of tests, the doctor advised the patient that he would have to get rid of his hound dog because evidently he was allergic uh, to his hound dog. And as the patient was preparing to leave the office, the doctor just asked him out of curiosity if he planned to sell the dog or give it away. Well, neither one, said the patient. I'm going to get me one of them their second opinions I've been hearing about. It's a lot easier to find another doctor than it is to find a good hound dog. 
you know, you and I this evening, what we need to do to grow strong in Jesus, we know what we need to do. It's called commitment. Commitment is personal. And unless our choices put Jesus first, we cannot be his disciples. We have to decide whether or not we're going to give our all to Jesus or if we're going to ask for another opinion. See, being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus has an element of risk to it. But if we are willing to do what is required, I can promise you God will be with us. We must step out or we'll never do anything. We must go beyond what we think we can do. You know, I'm out to change the world, God and me. No reserve, no retreat, no regrets, but I have to be willing to commit to the word of God in my life. So Paul and Barnabas, they devote themselves to teaching these young believers. You know, as the apostles touch their lives, they shape them into godly men and women. And these young believers, they're going to need a lot of strength because they had some incredible trials that they had to go through. Uh, they, they had some, some inevitable uh, problems and, and difficulties that, they would ha that were awaiting them, and they needed to be strengthened before they faced those. And they're also going to need encouragement. And that was the, the missionary's second objective. They encouraged them to persevere realistically. Now, what that, what that means is, is that as Paul and Barnabas returned to each city, we're told in verse 22 of Acts 14, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. See, these guys didn't just teach the word of God, but they encouraged the new converts to be obedient to the word of God. See, the Bible tells us not to be just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Believers, they need to be taught sound biblical truths, but also believers need to be encouraged to be obedient to what the Word of God tells us. Exhortation to obedience must always accompany Bible teaching. And as pastors, that's important. As we teach our folks the Word of God, we must also encourage them to be obedient to what the Word of God says. Now, notice that Paul and Barnabas, they're not trying to paint a rosy, uh, trouble-free future, but they are preparing the believers for battle. These raw recruits, they need to understand the harsh reality of persecution. They need to understand that tribulation will come, but with the Lord, they can persevere. Hang in there, Paul and Barnabas are saying. You can make it. Don't give up when the going gets tough. You know, Jesus had similarly uh, encouraged his disciples. In John chapter 16, verse 33, he said, In the world, you're going to have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. See, believers need to be reminded, and they need to expect hardships and persecution and not be dismayed when those things happen. We are constantly in a battle against the enemy of our soul. Now, the third thing that we see Paul and Barnabas doing is that they gave assistance in the realm of organization. You know, there are few things that are more frustrating than the lack of a clear plan and the leadership to carry things out. So wisely, we're told that the missionaries in, in verse 23 of Acts 14 says, so when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting. Now, that word elders in the Greek, um, sometimes they were called bishops or overseers. 
See, the office was the same. Uh, they had to be spiritually qualified according to the guidelines that Paul later listed in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and again in Titus chapter 1. Those under shepherds of the great shepherd were to faithfully lead and care for the flock of God long after Paul and Barnabas had left and, and gone to other locations. And the fact that some had reached a level of maturity, it required, uh, you know, it required them to grow. And, and the fact that they were able to show that kind of maturity, Paul and Barnabas's teachings and exhortation were the, were the results of that. Now, we're also told that the elders were chosen only after the group had prayed with fasting. And that shows the seriousness with which the selection process should be and approached. You know, Luke says that Paul and Barnabas appointed these elders. You know, if we further explore the Greek word for appoint, uh, it means that they stretched, and it's an old verb that originally meant to vote by show of hands, finally to a point with the approval of an assembly that chooses, as in Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 19, and then to a point without regard to choice. So were the elders selected by congregational vote or literally chosen by Paul and Barnabas? Well, we really can't be sure, but we do know that elders served a vital leadership role in the early church, as they do in many churches today. Sometimes, though, we quibble about these sorts of issues, you know, how to select leaders and how many leaders there ought to be or what title we think we need to give them. But unlike doctrine, those, those kinds of issues are flexible. Therefore, we must be open to different styles of organization as long as those styles advance and not hinder the gospel of Christ. Another thing that they were able to do, Paul and Barnabas, they entrusted the group to the Lord. Now, we've seen Paul and Barnabas teach and encourage and organize these young believers and next, we see that they entrusted them into God's care. Verse 23 says, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. You know, the Greek word for commend means to deposit, as in a bank. See, the apostles, they entrusted their priceless newborn believers into the Lord's hands for safekeeping. You know, such an attitude acknowledges the Lord Jesus as the head of the church and the source of all our power as believers. And the action highlighted God's trustworthiness as well as the danger of hero worship. See, Paul and Barnabas, they were just men, just like us. And the people needed to learn to place their faith in God, not in, in people. Only one more objective remained for Paul and Barnabas on their return trip. With their evangelism and edification work now completed, they simply had to just, well, finish the course. We're told that they finished what they set out to accomplish. Acts 14 verse 24 tells us, And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Attilia. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work for which they had completed. See, for many months, Paul and Barnabas had been out on their own. No one had followed them with a clipboard in hand to keep them on schedule. They didn't send out any progress reports or monthly newsletters, yet the two travelers had been faithful to their task. And the Holy Spirit had commissioned them for a job, and they had done it, not in their own strength, but by the grace of God. Landing at Seleucia, 
they hiked those last few miles home to Antioch, and their steps were probably quickening the closer they got to home. How they longed to bask in the fellowship of friends and family, and to taste familiar food, and to walk familiar streets, and to be home. The church at Antioch was no doubt overjoyed at the return of their two beloved uh, pastors. Their work, commended at the outset by the grace of God, had been remarkably successful as the missionaries began their report. Verse 27 tells us, Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Now, some folks may have come home and they would begin to boast about what they had done, you know, of all the churches that they had planted or the number of new converts that they had won, uh, the, new, the miracles that they had performed, but not Paul and Barnabas. They kept all their accomplishments in the proper perspective. The Bible says that they talked about all that God had done with them. You see, it wasn't them the ones that they were, they were not the ones doing it. It was God working through them. Now, is that great or what? You know, no big time press conference extolling a successful campaign. No fundraisers. No self-serving interviews with some Christian radio station in order to draw attention to themselves. I notice a subtle point that Luke makes in, in, in uh, verse 24. It says that they gathered the church together. He didn't say that they gathered the Christians into the church, but they gathered the church. See, to the early believers, the church meant the people, not the building. We say, well, let's go to church. But we are the church, and everywhere we go, the church goes as well. What we call the church is nothing more than a meeting place. God's true temple is made of flesh and, and bone, not brick and concrete. As the church gathers together, Paul and Barnabas give a two-way report. First, they emphasize what God has done. They don't say, we did this and we did that. God was the one who was convicting hearts. God was the one who was nurturing faith. God was the one who was implanting joy in those new converts. The second thing that they do is, is that they announce that the Gentiles have come to know the Lord. God had opened wide the doors of faith so that now even pagans could enter the kingdom of God. This was amazing news in those days, for the Jews had faithfully guarded those doors for centuries. And Paul and Barnabas, they saw themselves as instruments through whom God had accomplished his purposes, and all the glory went to him. That's an essential perspective for a servant of the Lord. Through their spirit giftedness, boldness, power, humility, persistence, caring, commitment, and reverence for God, Paul and Barnabas had been used to accomplish much for the kingdom of God. And those qualities still mark those who walk the path to effective Christian service today. How rare it was for Gentiles to believe in the Jewish God, as rare as it is for Muslims or Hindus to believe in Christ today. Think of how incredible it would be if thousands of Muslims became Christians during a, a crusade in, in, in Baghdad. See, that was the impact of the missionaries' report, how it affected the people. So together the church rejoices because of the gospel's life-giving, changing power. And God's protection of Paul and Barnabas, what a wonderful homecoming for these two men. Then the weary travelers settle down for a needed rest. Verse 28 tells us, so they stayed there a long time with the disciples. <clears throat> 
<coughs> in the last couple chapters of Acts, we've strapped on our backpacks and we've hiked along with these missionaries across the island of Cyprus, all over Asia Minor, and back home again. And it's been a rewarding first missionary journey, also a painful one. And as we reflect on our trip, there are two lessons that sort of interject themselves on our tattered uh, maps. First of all, it is at the end of a difficult experience that God reveals the benefits. You know, another apostle emphasized this point in his epistle to the believers in Asia Minor. <coughs> 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 says, But may the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. You know, in Paul's report, Peter must have marveled at what God had done through his sickness, uh, through John Mark's departure through the, all the opposition and even the stoning. And the same is true for us as our storm passes through <clears throat> and we can see clearly again. For after the suffering, we realize that God has been perfecting us and he's been establishing and confirming and, and strengthening us all along. A second lesson we learn is, is that sometimes the ravages of sin preempt the blessing of God. You know, Paul's body must have borne the aches of sickness and the scars of stoning, but it was his heart that probably hurt the worst. God had brought many to salvation, yet how many others were still caught in the grasp of sin. And as Paul looked toward the West, the faces of these men and women in need of salvation flashed through his mind. One day he would get back to them and travel even farther into Macedonia and Greece, and eventually he would end up in Rome itself. But for now, he could only dream, as you and I do, of an entire world coming to know Christ. Why don't you pray with me? Father, we just want to thank you. We thank you for the encouragement that we get in reading your word. Father, we pray especially for all those Christian leaders out there who may be listening to these words. Father, help us to be faithful. Help us to be faithful to teach your word. Help us to be faithful to encourage the believers to obey your word. Father, just help us to encourage one another. Father, I pray that you would encourage those who are listening to this video. Father, I pray that you would help each of us to draw close to you. Father, that we would hear what you want to say to us in your word. Help us to depend upon your Holy Spirit. But most of all, Father, we give you all the praise and the glory for anything that might be accomplished through our ministries. For, Lord, it's not us who are doing these things. It is you. Thank you, Father. We praise you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. On Sunday mornings, we are currently in our summer sermon series, which we're calling Empowered by the Spirit. And in this series, we're looking at how the Holy Spirit prepared the disciples for the coming of the day of Pentecost. And our focus is on Acts chapter 1, leading up to the events just before the empowering of the church. This series is going to take us through the end of the summer, so be reading through the first chapter of the book of Acts. If you're unable to be with us on Sundays, uh, be watching for a video of the message to be posted sometime Sunday around noon on both Facebook and YouTube. And we'll be back, Lord willing, next Wednesday night uh, with part 11 of our Life of Paul online Bible study. <clears throat> 
If you miss any of the lessons or the sermons, you can check them out on Facebook or on our YouTube channel. Uh, just You can watch them there. Just type in Lebanon First Church of God into the search bar on YouTube, and you should be able to find our channel. If you have a Google account, a Gmail account, uh, you can log into YouTube using your Google account, and you can actually subscribe to our channel. So check it out. Thanks again for joining in today, and may God bless you as you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You are loved. See you next time.